You're welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. We're now talking about the food blockade, you know, from the north to the southern part of Nigeria and reviewing the interdependency of the two regions. We know that in, in the past couple of weeks, the discourse really has been about security. The farmers heard as clashes and basically how, you know, so, so many northern go southern governors had, you know, put a ban on open grazing, given ultimatums to, you know, cattle herders in the southern states to leave their territory, you know, within seven days. And how some associations in the north did not take this, you know, did not take this line down. Basically, Mieti Allah Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria, as well as the Amalgamated Union of Foodstuff and Cattle Dealers of Nigeria, you know, say that they need to get a 450 million billion naira compensation for you know the death of you know herders in the south uh, during the entire protests, the Shasha crisis, and all of that. Or they were going to stop you know transporting food from the north and the south. They did do that, and we saw that the price of food stuff skyrocketed when they were even available. Uh, but good thing now is that they've actually uh, stopped the blockade. They met with the, the president yesterday. Uh, to make their demands officially. Uh, joining us to discuss this is Public Affairs Analyst Ahmed Buhari. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, would you agree that this situation that has occurred between the North and South just went on to show how much interdependency that we have and maybe might even need in Nigeria? Yeah, obviously, there is uh, so much that connects us together. There's so much that we depend on each other. Um, it's unfortunate that we keep allowing these things, you know, come over to separate us, further divide us, further confuse us. Uh, sometimes some people might say it's political, but in most cases, I think it's just our inability to understand and see beyond what the what is uh, in front of us. I. I, I said to everybody that I do not see any reason why I would, you know, make myself suffer economically just because I'm trying to make the southern part of the country feel the hunger. On, on the other hand, I just feel like we have actually sort of slightly developed from what we used to do before. Before now, if there was any case of the sorts that happened with Sunday Bo and the boys in, in Ibadan, what you will find in the north will be lots of killings of people from the Yoruba extraction. Well, we didn't see it happen this time around. It, rather, we're seeing the people trying to look for other means to actually send a message that they were in disagreement or they didn't like what was happening. So in my opinion, I think, yes, I think we're moving forward, I hope. Um, I think it's also important for us to understand that one of the reasons why this will continue going on and on is because we haven't been able to put a legal instrument into all the things that are happening. What do I mean by legal instrument? I'm talking about people getting arrested, people going to for trial, and then people getting convicted for the acts that they have actually orchestrated. Whether it be, you know, killing farmers, whether it be being, being clashes, somebody has got to ask, answer the questions in the court of law. And if people don't see that happening, people will start planning on, on different ways to take laws into their hands. All right. Um... Good morning once again, Ahmed. You, you mentioned, you know, sending a message. And I'm going gonna, gonna to start with, with that um, because of a narrative that I had, you know, read, you know, where people said um, that this moves, you know, are very, very similar. And it might be scary, but I, I would like to get your views on this, that this, you know, it seems like, a, you know, people trying to feed off what happened in the Civil War where food, which is a basic, you know, human right, was being withheld from, you know, other parts of the, you know, of the country. Um, and, of course, uh, there are certain people who felt like, oh, maybe we should do a repeat of what happened back then. So is that a scary narrative to put out? And, you know, do, do you see some sense in that? Of, of course it's worrisome. Of course it's worrisome. Only people who haven't experienced war would be calling for it. I, I always believe that there are different ways to, to quell this kind of problems. There are different ways to make sure that um, everybody understands what's going on. And in my opinion, the biggest problem we're having here is the lack of dialogue. Um, we need to sit down. We need to talk. We need to realize that hate 
is not the first enemy of love. It is fear. Because it's that fear that destroys our ability to trust. What is going on right now is a group of people who are unable to talk to themselves, who are unable to sit down to understand what is going on. And then the worst thing that you can have for your country, this is like directing it to the leadership, is when the people do not trust in the leadership anymore and then are now taking laws into their hands. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about, you know, the seeming genesis of this matter, which is that they're saying the people have been attacked and killed, cattle have been killed, and that they needed to be compensated for this. Do you feel compensation, you know, monetary compensation really is the way to go? And uh, just yesterday, they, we saw that representatives of the Cattle Breeders Association went to Asorok to officially make their demands known. And we saw Kogi State Governor Yahya Bello saying they've put the demands on the table. The federal government will look into the compensation. But really, is this the solution to the problem? Because if we have something like this again, do we keep pumping money to solve problems? Obviously, people have lost um, valuables. Um, the most important thing here is who is actually taking, who is actually valuing what has been what has been lost, and who is expected to pay for what has been lost. You know, so if these things are not clear, it's very hard for you to direct who is supposed to pay what and what they're supposed to pay. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's important for us not to over politicize the issues. Um, Cattle rearing, cattle ranching, whether grazing, as the case may be, is something that has been going on in the West African region for over 100 years. These people are nomads. This is exactly what they do. But as, like I've been saying in many, many uh, interviews that I have granted, it is important for us to understand that one of the reasons why all of this is happening is because these people, in the last 20 years or so, we've been having governments succeed, succeeding each other, coming to tell us that they want us to go back to agriculture. So as I speak with you right now, most of those... Um, most of those pathways that those cattle and, the, and, the, and their herders would normally follow are now farmlands where people actually grow and make money for themselves. So, but the time, but whenever those cattle come back to this supposed grazing routes, they find out that there is agriculture going on there, there's farming going on there. And the moment they move through those farms, they actually destroy people's investment. So I understand that there's friction as a result of people meeting up with each other at different points. Um, what I think we should be doing now is to say, okay, fine. What are we going to do as a government? What is the government expected to do? And, and we've said this thing many times. What stops us from actually having those grazing areas? What stops us from actually having those ranches? Why is everybody so scared? Who even, why, why do we think that this whole cattle is for a particular tribe? Who says an evil man can't be a cattle herder? Who says a Yoruba man can't can be a cattle herder or a house man? So the moment you can actually remove this from our minds that, oh, I cannot do this, and those people who want to do it here, we're not going to allow them to do it, we're going to keep having these problems. In my opinion, I think it's about time we actually agree to, or oh, at least for a second, trust the government when it comes with the plans to say, okay, fine, let's have grazing areas or let's have ranches. As a governor in the southern part of the country, I'll be so excited about this because I've been, I'm sure most of them always complain about their inability to actually pull together um, internal, internal generation revenue. This is a good time, you know. Mm. It's either you're going to be benefiting from the milk, from the, from the back of the cows, from this high skin, from, even from the dung. You can actually, you know, use that for bio, biofuel. So I do not know and I do not understand why um, we have actually come back to this point where we, we, we're so angry with each other when clearly we can see that one of the reasons why all of this is happening is because everybody's back to the farm. Lots of agricultural uh, works are going on, and the moment this cut to come, they, they trample up on everything. All right. Is, is, is it also a great time to, um, of course, um, what we learn from all of this, you know, should, should it be, aside better uh, ways to unite the country and understand how, you know, interdependent we can be and see the values that we should have from every section of the country? Is, is it also a great time to actually encourage more people to farm so that they can be fully independent of the food that they eat. Um, is, is that one of the things that we should learn from this across the country? Every day, every day, every day we keep saying the same things. That's the only way out of this whole struggle. If we're not able to feed ourselves, then there's a big tr problem. Um, for many people um, around the world, they're actually able to, if, for those who have got fertile lands, they're able to grow whatever it is that they have to eat before they start thinking of, about ex exporting other things. And I like the fact that you've talked about this interdependency because one of the things that we've also been saying is we, we, must, we must be hoping 
to have a government in place that is able to let us understand that we must leverage on our comparative economic advantages. Now that you can see that the, the food stuff stopped flowing to the south for a few days, we saw how it actually shook the economy of the south. But guess what? It actually shook the economy of the north because some of these people would not eat except they actually get these things to the south. The same way, um, tomato, for example, in the markets became so cheap all of a sudden because they had excess and they needed to dispose them. So any way you want to look at this, we are interconnected. And, you know, people talk about the amalgamation. Oh, it was a mistake. There was no need for this. But listen, there was a reason why the people who did the amalgamation did the amalgamation. They did it because they wanted to have a balanced space where they can find things from the south, things from the north, from the east, from the west, to put together an economy that will be viable. And it did work. What is wrong with us right now is because as, as Africans, like I keep saying, we are unable to see that we are each other's keepers, brothers keepers, and then we come up with all of these ideas that you know keep instilling fear into the minds of people, believing that oh, the Obama is my problem, the house is my problem, or the evil is my problem. At the end of the day, I've been saying it last, last. Everything, that, all we want is just money in our hands, food in our on our tables. That is just all. And so, if it is about the economy, we expect that the government will actually sit on the fact that it has got a responsibility. And what is our responsibility to ensure that they leverage or we leverage on our comparative economic advantages? It's beyond even just agriculture. It comes with many other things, including skill. There are some skills you find in the north, you don't find in the south, you find in the south, you don't find in the north. All of these are supposed to be put together, and we need somebody in the center, which happens to government, to, uh, to, uh, to, to sort of let us know what is here or what is there and how we can benefit from this sort of um, coming together to promote unity to boost the economy and to create a, right. a, 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 a level playing field where we can have peace. Okay, I, I also want to, you know, ask um, uh, something, you know, a little tricky here. Um, there is also, you know, statements that I've seen, you know, that basically are saying um, not everybody in the north agrees with or agreed rather with the idea of a blockade. Uh, there are people from Benue, from Plateau State, farmers from southern Kaduna and, and the likes who have no issues selling their food. And so it was really, you know, one, you know, one particular tribe that, you know, took that decision that affected every other part, you know, every other farmer from the, from the north. I want you to quickly address that, you know, and how, you know, what, what the reaction really is from those, you know, other tribes that make up northern Nigeria that are not Fulani. So, so yeah, so what tribe did you say actually stopped the, um, promoted the blockade? Say that again. What tribe are you saying promoted the blockade? What tribe was behind the blockade? Well, it's not, it's not clearly stated, you know, but the, the insinuation or the narrative really is that um, there's other farmers who are in Fulani. And of course, the, the, the narrative has always been a, oh, Fulani people are trying to sell their cattle and they've had issues. And so, you know, that's where the challenge has started from. Yeah, so this affected food stuff really, yeah? And Fulani do not really partake in much agriculture. Uh, it's important for us to understand that um, they, they, are, they take over the space where we have to do with cattle rearing and all of that. But when it comes to food, um, it's um, other tribes in the north that do that, from houses to teas to Dharma yes. to people from parts of um, um, Kaduna and Joss. So um, I, I do, that's, that's why I asked you the question, like, who... Who were the people that actually promoted the blockade? And if you're going to say it's Fulani people, then obviously they don't have agricultural produce like the other, the other tribes put together. So um, I just think that we must continue to promote um, an atmosphere that will bring about stability. I also think that it's important that at this point in time, we understand that um, we are interconnected and interdependent, and we must respect that. There must be mutual respect. People must not take laws into their hands because when they do, everything falls apart. And I'm also praying that the government will actually, you know, stand firm and actually push together policies that would promote peace, harmony, and economic viability. Absolutely. Okay, so I think one of the things this whole situation revealed, this food blockade from, you know, the videos we saw and the news we heard shows that those trucks loaded with foodstuff, yam, tomatoes, and all of that, they were blocked in uh, Kwara State and they were prevented from leaving to other states. And uh, this situation here 
how would you say it has impacted or exposed Nigeria and where we stand regarding food security? So I, did, I, I, I didn't hear about 98% of what you said. And, and, and I think it's because of the um, complaint that I had from the beginning of this interview. But okay. I think I saw something about Quara. I heard something about Quara states and people. Oh, my God, I can't hear you. Oh, Mr. Buhari, how about now? Is it better? No, ma'am. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear okay. you, but it's coming with so much um, feedback. Oh, apologies. Um, if you can hear me, I was trying to ask you how you feel the situation exposed Nigeria's food insecurity. Yes, yes. Um, I, think, I, 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 think, I think it will put our, our food insecurity. Like I said, I'm, I'm glad that um, the ban has been lifted, whoever was, whoever was placing the ban has decided to leave the ban. The, 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 my biggest concern in all of this is I would have really expected more from the government. I really want to see more from the government. I need the government to pay, pr play a stronger role. Let it take the front, front seat. Everybody, everybody can sit down and have an organization. I can sit down today, call five of my friends, and we're going to have an organization. We'll call ourselves uh, the Northern Youths Northern Youth of Africa, whatever the case might be. And, and everybody wants to listen to us. I just want the government to stand in front and say, look, nothing happens without our consent. It has to happen through us. Let them take a dominant position in all of this. Once that dominant position is missing, we will keep having this kind of news flying around. We keep having this kind of fear flying around. And like I said again, hate is not the first enemy of love. It is fear. Because that fear destroys our ability to trust. Okay, so what's... I know you've mentioned here that you're looking forward to the government taking a more decisive step, a more decisive stance in this issue. But looking more practically, what do you expect the government or suggest that the government does in this situation, especially so we can avoid a repeat in future? I have said it before. Make arrests. When you find people that have committed atrocities such, such as this, they should be arrested, they should be tried, and they should be convicted. Whatever the case might be, people need to see that there's a, there's a system that is working in place. There's a judicial system that they can be scared of. Nobody is scared of anything right now. Many people feel like they can actually get away with, with, with crimes. That is the first thing. And then the second thing, the government has got to be in the center of all of this. This is not the first time we've been having clashes in, in this country. It has nothing to do with President Muhammad Buhari. It has nothing to do with Professor Yemir Shibajo. It has everything to do with how we have seen ourselves over the years and we need a system in place that will make us stop seeing ourselves as mere neighbors but as economic beneficiaries to each other if we're able to leverage on our comparative economic advantages and our, our inability to leverage on our comparative economic advantages is the real thing that is causing all of this that is happening mm. right. i don't have to be friends with uh, with with you for, if we don't want to be friends but if we have business that we're doing together i will call you every morning to say my sister how are you doing can we talk about when the next consignment is going to come up or something like that. But it is not happening. Everybody is just doing his own thing in his own space and believing that they don't need the other people or believing that the other people are like parasitic. And I think one of the reasons why all of this is happening is because the North has heard over time that they are parasitic. And now they are actually pulling one of the things that they have strength in, which, is called, which has to do with agriculture, which has to do with the food that we have in a, the food that goes around the country. So now that they've held it back, it is a message they're sending to say, you know what, we also have something that we can actually hold back and, you know, get to hurt you. All right. This is just simply what it is. Good point you made about, you know, the presidency and the government taking a stronger stance. Um, and as I was asking about a more practical stance, you know, and it's, it's not, you know, just about words. Because now we're reading in the news this morning that there are people who are meeting the presidency and making demands even after what has happened in the last few days. Um, where, of course, you know, uh, I would, I, I, I would have really expected, I would yes. have really expected that the presidency would have called for that meeting before the people actually presented themselves for that meeting. I would have expected that, the, that even when they called and said we want to have a meeting, I expect the presidency to say, "Hold on, I need the other side of the, I need the other party to be here as well while I have that meeting with you. I want to have the meeting with all of you at the same time. Let us have a lasting solution to these problems." But it's okay. not happening again. So these guys are going to come, say their part. 
go away. Maybe the other ones will come tomorrow, say their part, go away. And we are still failing hmm. to work together. And well, that is why the problems will never end. Quickly, quickly now speak um, in, in, in a minute, if you can. Um, the steps that must be taken by the presidency at a time like this to push for unity and, you know, and a more unified Nigeria. Because it's one of the things that seems to be lacking here. We seem to be too far apart and you know, misunderstanding each other at every uh, opportunity. So what must the president, and I'm talking President Muhammadu Buhari, do as from you know, now that we're speaking about this to ensure that the idea of unity is pushed as deep as possible across Nigeria? Talk to all parties together with the intention to see that there's lasting solutions to their problems. Push for grazing areas or ranches, as the case may be, and explain it to Nigeria in clear terms why you believe this will work. I believe it will work. I believe it will solve most of the problems. Even as it is, there's no, there's no problem if this is going to be done under the, the supervision of the state governors. This is, this is not supposed to be the way it is. And, and I've heard some people say they are free to carry guns. Look, there's an ECOWAS treaty that allows the free movement of cartoon herders across the West African states. This full analysis will tell you that this, this is what we know, this is what our forefathers have been doing, and there's an ECOWAS treaty to back what we're doing. However, they also carry light weapons. And the reason why they carry light weapons is because they go through the jungles, they go through the forest. Now, this is not me condoning the, the, the carrying of arms. The only way we can actually stop them carrying arms, if, they, if, if we have found those who carry arms, is to say, you know what, this is your area. It is not your, it is not, it does not belong to you because you've purchased it, but it is, it is an area that the government is loaning to you while you continue with your activities of cattle grazing. Why do the Fulanis even go to the south in the first place with cattle grazing? It is simply because of the climate. Okay. As, the, right. as the years roll, as, as the seasons roll by, they're able to go down south to look for food for their, for their cattle. All, right. All of these things have got to be made very clear to the people in the south. All right. Um, we're out of time, you know, for this conversation. Um, it was, you know, a pleasure speaking with you. And thanks for your perspective on this very, very important uh, issue in Nigeria today. Thanks once again, Ahmed Buhari. For My pleasure. Us. Thank you. All right. <laughs> We're going to go on a short break, of course, when we come back. We're moving away from talking about a food blockade now and, you know, moving to talk about a blockade of drugs coming into Nigeria. Of course, uh, Buba Marwa, the head of NDLEA, has, you know, seem, or rather seems to be making a stronger stance with regards to the fight against uh, drug trafficking. When we come back, we're speaking with Femi, Baba Femi, the NDLEA spokesman here on The Breakfast.